Hello. An 18th century poet and essayist once wrote that if the world is cold, it is our business to build fires. When I read that, I thought, what an amazingly sensible thing to say. It's kind of common sense, isn't it? But in a world where we have so much that we're responsible for, and when technology is advancing so quickly, we think someone else is going to do it. Certainly, the technological experts will come up with something, if not the scientists. But we, as citizen scientists, have a responsibility and a joy to find gaps in society anywhere, no matter how big or how small, and make it our business to bridge them, resolve problems, and help develop a positive future. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna by any stretch of the imagination. I tend to be a little bit too theoretical at times, and as a designer and multimedia artist, that's a little bit unique. If you look back at Leonardo da Vinci and other artists, designers, scientists, technologists, you look into their work, you'll find that there was always something exciting that petitioned them into resolving a particular need that maybe didn't stand out right at first, something that was so obvious. Maybe it was something a little bit more subtle. I think that's where the real gem is, because it somehow ties very neatly into random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. That it doesn't have to be grandiose or major, and we don't have to become famous and tell each other what we should be doing to how to solve the future, but these little purposeful acts that we can make. And in our fields, to find something that hasn't been done yet and to engage it with a sense of dignity and purpose, but something that makes your life richer every moment. Design is a field that looks at this as an opportunity. Designers work to find this need and to resolve it through creativity, imagination, sometimes extraordinary discipline and talent. But nonetheless, it's to resolve something. I found a gap. That gap is in aging. It's the body. It deteriorates. We're growing older every moment, and people are dying every second. In fact, hundreds of thousands of people die every moment around the world. People age as our body deteriorates. And I thought, well, for goodness sakes, I'm aging. Oops, don't tell anyone. And no matter how much exercise you can do, no matter how healthy you are, we're still aging, and we do have a limited lifespan. For the human, it is somewhere around 122 to 123 years. And Jean Colmet, a French woman, died some years ago at 122. And there is a recent woman in Mexico who said that she's 126, but we don't have the validation of this. And there's some journalists who say, give it to her, let her be that age. And I say, no, wait a minute, because we have a society of people that need to know how long we can live and to protect ourselves and to that point, keep ourselves healthy and active. So, I found a gap, I found a problem, I'm aging. So I made it my business to do everything I can to slow it down a bit, if not reverse it, by designing an alternative body. Prima Posthuman is a whole body prosthetic. I designed it thinking about people in need, people who needed alternative bodies. This was a little bit before when robotics became so seamless and immersive with the brain, before we had narrow AI running uh, robotic limbs and before we had haptic systems with robotic limbs. But Primo Posthuman was for people whose bodies had diseased and were no longer functioning, especially people with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, and people with different types of cancers or injuries, uh, where their spinal cord was damaged, and they needed some type of body to get around. Not only that, as we age, we might want a different type of body. And in this world we're living in cyberspace a lot, we have avatars that form different types of bodies. So it is somewhat feasible that we could have new types of bodies, and that's why I designed Primo Posthuman. But that wasn't enough, because I started thinking that, what if this theoretical design that I built in 1997 would not be developed in enough time for me, as I become in my 90s, to 
use to transplant myself into or upload or download into it, what would I do? How could I do something today that's filling a gap, something with purpose, where I'd feel honorable and, and a bit of dignity about it, feel like I was giving forward something new and rich that hadn't been done before? And I thought, no, that's egocentric, because you're looking for something. You're looking for some gap that you can fill and put your name on it. So I stopped thinking along those terms, and I started looking out in every place I taught or gave a conference. I looked for what I could learn from others. And where I teach today at the University of Advancing Technology, the leading scholarly sense of rubrics is learn from your students. You're not there to lecture at your students. So I thought, okay, my strategy. Two things that interest me more than anything in the world, human and, well, my husband, of course, and my dog, and, and my friends, <laughs> and the laughter of people and, and remembering great Oh, great memories. I think great memories are, are up there at the top after my husband and my dog and great friends, etc. But um, I thought human enhancement has is, is been a field I've been involved in for many, many years, and I absolutely love it as a designer. It's great. Devices, seamlessness, emerging technologies, speculative technologies, especially the human body with technology. And I thought about aging, okay, so on one hand, I'm really out there into the future, and I love it. it. Really makes me happy. On the other hand, I'm aging. Okay, so I love being mature. I wouldn't change my age for anything. But it's going to be degenerating more and more. And when I see people that I love very dearly becoming more diseased and more vulnerable, less secure in who they are because their bodies are becoming weak, it does make me sad. I've had cancer twice. I lost a, a baby in my pregnancy, died because technology hadn't advanced enough to save its life, and almost not mine. So I'm very sensitive to these things, and I'm glad. I think that everything that we go through in life that we say, why me? Why you? You're, you're lucky to have it, you, because you learn from it, if you can turn it around and make it work for you. So my strategy was to put these two together. What did I do? I was giving a talk at a um, conference in Moscow last year. It was the uh, Sports Accord Convention, and a lot of the Olympians are there. And it's really a, a big extravaganza where that's where they um, showed who was bidding for the 2020 Olympics, whether it would be Istanbul, Turkey, if it's going to be Madrid, Spain, or Tokyo, Japan. So I watched this, it was fabulous. But at this conference, I was on stage on a panel about human enhancement and the future of the Olympics. On stage with me were two Olympians, uh, one gold medalist. I'm not sure if the other one was a gold medalist or not, but he had uh, false legs. So that was very interesting, and it was just apropos because we were talking about what would it be like if we had different types of bodies for the Olympics. And my logic was, we have the Paralympics, why not have a Super Olympics? So, if we had a Super Olympics based on the Paralympics and other types of modalities for people to enjoy enhancement rather than be restricted from it, what would that all mean? Now, if you break the law and you use enhancement drugs and compete in sports and lie about it, that's not a very ethical or moral thing to do, certainly. But if people are going to be enhancing, let's take a look at how to do it ethically. Okay. Uh, a few months ago, I was in Japan speaking at the Topos conference. I was invited to talk about what Japan is going to do about this aging generation of people 65 and older, and the fact that there are fewer and fewer births in Japan. Well, this is pretty much a trend that's going on in a number of countries, and it's something we all need to be thinking about. What happens when more and more people are getting older and living longer because of enhancement and fighting the aging process, and fewer and fewer people are giving birth? That could mean some economic disaster, right? Makes sense. People work, they spend money. People don't work, they're not going to spend so much money, and it drains the society. But it's not healthy for the person. You lose your sense of perspective when you don't have that passion, that joie de vivre in life. Okay, reality check. Number one, how can we live longer and protect ourselves? Have your genes sequenced. How many of you have had your genes sequenced? Uh, Oh, hi, <laughs> I, I have a soulmate out there. Having your genes sequenced is not an expensive thing. Some years ago it was very expensive, but today you can get it done by $99.
So $99, you can have your genes sequenced. Now it's not your whole genome, but you can get them sequenced. 23andMe, Silicon Valley. Eat wisely and exercise. Duh, yeah, we know about that. Have a purpose in life, yes. Sign up for cryopreservation or have your brain backed up. Okay, now let's look logically at this. We can get our gene sequence and find out if we have a disease that's coming along like Alzheimer's or ALS or another disease, but our memory is really important to us, so we want to know about how our memory is going to be preserved as we live longer. Chronics, cryopreservation, well, I don't know. I don't know, there's some question there. Backing up the brain, not possible. Yes, neuroscientists, cognitive scientists are working on this, but it's not possible today. So, what would be the far out thing to do, sign up for chronics. But if you sign up for cryopreservation, there's a chance that you won't be you when you're defrosted or reanimated or warmed up, right? That's the big issue. Is it still you? This is the big issue of the 21st century at this stage. Identity, is it still me if you upload? Is it still me if you download? Is it still me if you have an avatar? Go into that cybernetic space, is it still you? We don't know. The issue with cryopreservation, it is the best safety net we have today for long life. But we don't know if someone who's brought back from cryopreservation is the same person. We don't know if your memory is going to be mush or if it's still functioning. So what is the purpose of living longer if you don't have your memories? Wow, I got it. And it was honest and it was good and I felt good. My design brain was functioning really well. Connection, the human connectome. Oh, wait, there is no human connectome that we know of, really. We haven't sequenced the whole human genome, so how do we know about the connectome? Okay, I've had many MRIs done in my body and my brain. I put it together to create PMO posthuman, the future uh, whole body prosthetic. Memory by design, this is what I did. C. elegans is a microscopic roundworm also known as a nematode, that is one millimeter long. These nematodes are usually found in temperate soil environments worldwide. In the wild, they feed on the bacteria that help to decay, decomposing plant matter. In the laboratory, however, C. elegans are typically fed lab strains of E. coli. C. elegans are transparent, thus facilitating the study of the cellular differentiation and developmental fate of each of its cells. There are two forms, hermaphrodites and males. Hermaphrodites have 959 somatic cells, while males have 1,031. The organism's neural circuit, made up of only 302 neurons, is extremely primitive, especially when compared to the approximately 100 billion neurons and the 60 trillion connections between them, known as synapses, that make up the average human brain. However, as a result of its simplicity, transparent nature, and the well-characterized cell lineages, the entire pattern of neuron connections, or connectome, of the C. elegans has been mapped. Despite the relatively simple neuronal system present within C. elegans, it displays numerous complex and primitive behaviors. Primitive behaviors include feeding, locomotion, and reproduction. Complex behaviors include learning, mating, or social behaviors. Researchers study behavior of these worms by observing how they are attracted to food and chemicals. Ultimately, behaviors reflect the activity of the nervous system. Despite their small size and simplicity, C. elegans are very useful to science, both to understand basic biological mechanisms and also to study basic mechanisms of disease that translate to understanding how to fight disease in humans. This is the first animal, simple animal, to have its whole genome sequenced. And 3D interpretation. Now, it doesn't have a brain, so could it have memory? Yes, you betcha. The C. elegans is one of the most largely used organism in medical research. And it's been vitrified, it's been put in cryopreservation. Aha. So this became my gap I decided to fill. I fell in love with this worm. It mows so beautifully, the way it slithers gracefully across the petri dish with a sense of intent. This worm is hermaphrodite. Very few are males. It carries its own eggs. It has 302 neurons throughout its body. 
It's very sensitive to smells, and I tested it. And I made some research based on this. I created a team of scientists far more experienced than myself, but I was the idea person behind it. It was my passion. I wanted to build something that if ever I need to be put in cryopreservation, or anyone else, all the hundreds of people that are in cryopreservation, and our leading world-famed person who just was suspended recently, if you know the Bitcoin article, it's in Wired magazine, Hal Finney, marvelous human being, recently passed away from ALS, and he took the ultimate bucket challenge. He is now in cryonics, and I'd like to be part of the team that helps restore people based on a little bit of research that I did about memory. So I took the C. elegans, I trained them based on their olfactory, called learning with olfactory sensibility, and I trained them by smell with a chemical in a Petri dish to go towards the smell when they were just little babies, so it was imprinting psychology, but it's for long-term memory. I trained them with my lab assistant, Daniel Barocco of Spain, University of Seville, and we succeeded. We tested many, many C. elegant worms at that L1 stage when they're little, little tiny babies coming out of the larva. We influenced them with the olfactory imprinting. They became conditioned to it. We vitrified them after we trained them at L2 stage, waited till they grew up, tested them again, and they remembered. It was a successful experiment. I feel very happy about it. My paper's up there. This is the first time this research has been concluded. The scientific paper has not come out yet, so I thought I would bring it here and share it with you all. It doesn't mean that when people come out of cryopreservation that they will be the same person with all their memory intact, but what it does mean is that there's one step, one small little project that proved to be successful, and it was doubted for so long and call pretty much BS for a very long time. But we can see that if you have determination, if you find something that you're passionate about, something where you see that this was definitely cold, and I definitely warmed it up, and thank goodness its long-term memory was functioning because it still remembered what had been trained before the vitrification. Thank you.